Okay, we're recording. Okay, so this is Gordon Cooper Technology Center GPS Differential Radio Sound Tracker. With that, yep. go ahead. Yep, this is our uh, GPS Differential Radio Sound Tracker. I'm Paul Linder from Chandler High School. I'm Sarah Miller from Tecumseh High School. Connor Murray and Derek Carney were not able to make it today, unfortunately. So the problem we face is that most of the weather balloons that are launched every day, the equipment that comes with it are not recovered. And the equipment that is used, if we can recover it, it, we, it, it can be used again and it won't be a big waste of money. Because the equipment, you know, it's, it's very, very expensive. And um, there's, no, there's, no, there's no way of tracking without having a line of sight, which is a big problem. So the most reliable way to track a radio sign is to track it throughout spike but that has not been made yet. So our goal is to make a mobile balloon tracker that will stay in contact with the radio sound and, take, and uh, collect data from the radio sound. Um, the, the, our tracker will take the difference in GPS and altitude to determine the angle at which to point at. Our tracker will take in consideration of the, the direction it's facing that's due to the nine axis sensor that it has, meaning that by turning the tracker, it will stay pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Our tracker will improve the overall ability and efficiency to recover equipment. During our research, we found Colorado University attempted something very similar to what we're trying to achieve. They had a stationary tracker track unmanned aircraft. We will improve portability, heading correction, size, and ease of use. This is the diagram we used to develop our project. We created a prototype. Then we took ideas from uh, groups of people that are uh, experts in their field. We took their advice and got their uh, and took criticisms and we applied their feedback to our base design. So during our prototyping, since we didn't really know much about this, we had to take each part into consideration and figure out how to wire that and how they work separately so that we could be able to put them together. Uh, our very first prototype had several issues with it. So uh, as anyone does, we started to develop different solutions for those. This is when we attended a couple Elmer nights at a, a amateur radio club up in Norman. And we kind of explained our background and brought our project to them and explained the troubles that we were having. From there, they helped us a lot with any issues that we had. They helped us with our firmware installation on our LilyGo board, which receives the data from the radio salon. And they helped us find a way to transmit that back to our Arduino that ran our system. After that, we were able to get our Lily Goat implemented into our system and have it fully autonomous so that we did not have to manually input any data. Uh, so this is our function block diagram. This is basically how it all works. We have a Arduino, which takes information from the nine axis sensor and which also will take information from the Lily Go, which will collect data from the radio song. The, all this information will go into our, our a code and then it will output into our servos. This is how our tracking works. We got the red arrow is uh, the target heading, which is where we want our pointer to point at. Um, the heading is where is information we get from our nine-axis sensor and the output angle we get from the difference of the target heading and the heading. So for software testing, basically what we had to do was to make sure our coding worked. And we did this by simulating a, a uh, potential values in, uh, in our spreadsheet. And for mechanical testing, basically what we did was we had a, um, we, we made a, a, a code and uh, basically we, we put, we put uh, input, we put values in it to see if, if it worked, if the pointer works physically and it gets us the outcome we were looking for. Basically for system testing, we put the software and mechanical testings together. And um, basically, so 
So while we were working on our project, we had several setbacks that we ran into. Our, right from the start, our nine axis was being itchy. It was like, uh, it wasn't receiving data the way it should and it wasn't outputting it correctly. So we had to do a lot of code testing to figure out what was going wrong with that. Uh, whenever we went to the first meeting, the Elmer Knight meeting, our Lily Go, which is this right here, was not receiving the data correctly. And we figured out late, later that that was because we had installed the wrong firmware on accident. And it took us about a month to realize. So that was a huge setback in our time. Uh, we also had several coding issues and had to restart the code completely. Our first defined levels of success were that number one, it would be ran off of manual inputs and would just point in the direction of the balloon. So pretty basic. Level two was that we would still have to do a couple manual inputs, but we would be it would be fully mobile. You could move it anywhere and it would stay pointed at the radio sound where it was. Level three is that it would receive data from the radio son and we would not have to worry about it at all. Like it could just sit in the passenger seat of a car and point at the radio son as we're moving. It's fully mobile. And level four would be to attach some sort of camera or scope to that so that you could film the entire flight of the balloon. We successfully completed level three requirements uh, meaning that we got it fully mobile and autonomous. So we don't really have to do much with it other than connect it to power and then it'll fully track the balloon itself. Here's a couple videos in this first one that's playing. It shows you the little LED light that we implemented to show you when it's in the dead zone. Uh, there is a 30 degree dead zone in our servos where it just doesn't go. And then this one was tracking a radio son in real time and we just made little adjustments and saw it fix itself so that it stayed pointing at the radio song. Okay. The total cost of our project ended up being just a little over $215 with all the different components that you can see here that went into our project. And this is the end. So we would like to thank Ron Markham, our engineering instructor, Aaron Bouchon, our chapter NEBP director, and Mark Klein and the Scars Club for helping us with all of our issues. Thank you for listening. All right, very good. Uh, any questions? So Bill Brown put several things in the chat. I think he knows a bit about this stuff and you might want to check the chat on the Zoom call, uh, the presenters. You might want to check the chat and maybe Bill, you want to make some comments orally? Oh yeah, that, that's a great uh, presentation. And uh, the LilyGo is a very cheap uh, uh, radio that you can uh, buy and then you load some firmware from MySandi and it updates it to track uh, you know the frequencies and uh, to do radius on uh, decoding and then it actually links uh, through a bluetooth to a android app and it shows the position altitude and uh, a map of where where it's over so a lot of people are using them to uh, track and recover radio songs when they aren't chasing uh, student balloons uh, a lot of us are doing that just for fun, and uh, and it's nice. You can actually use these uh, some of these uh, sons. You can modify them for ham radio uh, telemetry, and there's firmware out there to update uh, the sons when you get them. So this is a, a free source of sons if you live near a, the place where they land usually. And then I also uh, mentioned that uh, you're all familiar with amateur dot. Uh, sontub.org for tracking amateur radio balloons, but uh, there's actually a version of that site called tracker.sontub.org, and I posted that link too, and that uh, tracks the live radio songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can update, uh, you can link your data into that website, which would be a really cool thing and uh, aid to people that are uh, tracking these radio songs. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that's what our morning group did. Our afternoon yeah. group at Gordon Cooper actually did something very similar to that, where they took that and did upload it onto Sonic. Oh. So remind me, you are part of the an NEBP atmospheric sciences team, is that correct? Yes. And so did you use this device to track your NEBP balloons? Uh, we plan to on the April eclipse. We did not have it fully done by the October one as we started in August. So we will we do plan on recovering a couple on the April eclipse. And do you have to be chasing them while they're in the air or can you more or less go get them the next day or maybe at least after the eclipse is over? Uh, it's easier if you go to the spot where you think like within like a 20 mile radius of where it might land. So that way as it's falling, you have a clear line of sight and you're able to track it more accurately. Otherwise there could be data loss. Well, not data loss, but just like loss of connection a little bit. So you could still use it. It would just be a little bit more difficult. Sure. It also depends on how long the radios last or the batteries last. Uh, I suppose yep. they're designed to last for a flight, but not necessarily very much longer than that. So you kind of kind of got to be there pretty soon after they land, I suspect. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we noticed that sometimes they do die before they land on uh, the different models of songs. But uh, yeah, you have to be there pretty quickly after they land to, to get to them. Any other questions? Okay. If not, thank you so much. This is a great presentation. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, thank guys. You.